Shalom Uvraha. Welcome to Monday School. I invite you to turn with me to Amos chapter 4. We're going to start reading at verse 6. And after we look at verses 6 to 12, and I think I'll throw, throw in verse 13 as a bonus, then we'll look at 1 Peter chapter 4. Verses 12 to 19. So, before we start reading, join me in prayer, will you please? Gracious God, our Father, we are ever thankful for the beauty of each day as you provide it. We thank you for giving us a day of blessing, of sunshine. Uh, we thank you for the recent rains. We ask that you would continue to provide uh, for your people. That you would watch over all inhabitants of this earth and assure them of your presence and your power. We ask, O oh Lord, as we open your word, that you would give us wisdom and insight, enable us to understand your perspective your commandments, uh, the things that you would teach us if we would but let you teach us. Give us listening ears, open our eyes to see, and uh, as we study, we're also mindful of those who need a special touch from above, members of Jean's family, uh, Laura's mom as she undergoes testing next week. Uh, Tina's mom, as she starts a, a new medication. And Mrs. Spicer's family, uh, these neighbors of Mike and Nancy, would you, O oh Lord, uh, bless the Spicers and give them the comfort that you alone can give. We ask your continued blessing upon our pastor. We ask that you would give us all hearts that listen for your words uh, you, that, that are open to your touch. Um, this we pray in the blessed name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amos chapter 4, starting with verse 6. I gave you empty stomachs in every city and lack of bread in every town, yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. I also withheld rain from you when the harvest was still three months away. I sent rain on one town but withheld it from another. One field had rain, another had none, and dried up. People staggered from town to town for water, but did not get enough to drink. Yet, you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. Many times I struck your gardens and vineyards, destroying them with blight and mildew. Locusts devoured your fig and olive trees, yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. I sent plagues among you as I did to Egypt. I killed your young men with the sword, along with your captured horses. I filled your nostrils with the stench of your camps, yet you have not returned to me declares the Lord. I overthrew some of you as I overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. You were like a burning stick snatched from the fire, yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. Therefore, this is what I will do to you, Israel, and because I will do this to you, Israel, Prepare to meet your God. 
and that 13th verse of chapter 4 that I promised reads, For behold, he who forms the mountains and creates the wind and declares to man what is his thought, who makes the morning darkness and treads on the heights of the earth, the Lord, the God of hosts, is his name. So God is signing off, if you will, on this message that Amos is delivering. Now, who is Amos? He is self-identified in the first chapter, first verse, as a shepherd and a gatherer of sycamore fruit. Now, there is a particular tree in that region, region called a sycamore fig, and the fruit of the sycamore fig was referred to as a fig, even though it, it's apparently a fruiting version of a sycamore tree. But that was one of his occupations, the other being uh, that he is a shepherd, but not like a shepherd in the field who is uh, caring for a flock, then raising uh, wool that he spends all of his time watching over the flock out in some distant pasture, that what Amos is doing, he lives about 12 miles south of Jerusalem in an area that was known for raising sheep and goats to be sold for uh, slaughter as sacrificial animals. So they were uh, cared for and very closely watched for any defect uh, that, that they were. This, these were special animals that sold at a, I don't know that it was necessarily a premium price, but certainly above what you would get from your garden variety sheep in that uh, Amos is in that business. And understanding that he lives in uh, Judah, the southern kingdom, but he was called by God to prophesy. And uh, when we were discussing this face-to-face, at, uh, at church Sunday, the question arose, I made the comment that, that he was not a professional prophet. And what I meant by that is that ordinarily the prophets that are listed in the Old and New Testaments were called by God but were in some way associated with the ministry of the temple or the priesthood. They had that, if you will, connection. Uh, and that uh, when you read about Elijah and Elisha, that there were men who gathered around them who were uh, would-be prophets, and that the, the people who gathered around these prophets were known as the school of prophets. Now, this is not uh, in, in compliance with the modern idea of a university, but it is more the idea that there is this group who travels with the prophet. They want to find out what it is to be a prophet, to discover if indeed they have the prophetic gift, the prophetic call, that it would be recognized by others 
and that by their association with another prophet, they would be regarded as a prophet. Uh, that that's what I'm calling a, quote, professional prophet. Amos was not of that ilk, that he was a gatherer of sycamore fruit. He worked out in the country. He worked with his hands. He was, uh, he cared for these animals in the, in, in the flocks and, and saw that they were properly raised to be available as sacrificial animals. But that he had, as far as we know, not received any formal training other than he was acquainted with the word of the Lord. And when God called and sent him to the northern kingdom, he did not hold back. He went. But it is odd that he, a man of no particular qualification from the southern kingdom, would be called by God to go to the northern kingdom. Now you understand, the southern kingdom consists of Judah, and then there were some uh, people from Benjamin who allied themselves with with uh, the people of Judah. Uh, also, the uh, Levites, the Aaronic priesthood, because they were headquartered in Jerusalem, and Jerusalem was in Judah, uh, in Judea, properly called geographically, that um, that because the, the temple is there, that there is a congregation of the priestly that is there in, in Judah, in the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom consists of what are erroneously called the ten lost tribes of Israel. And their lostness is associated with the fact that they went into captivity um, in um, the, the 600s BC, that they were overtaken by um, Nebuchadnezzar and um, that having gone into captivity, they uh, were driven out of their, their home country. Now, that country, and, and of course, when we're talking about Amos here, he is warning them before they have gone into captivity but that what had happened, the ten tribes broke away from Judah and from the priests. And because they were not associated with the priests and because the temple was in Jerusalem, that Jeroboam, the first king of the northern kingdom, and, and as you're reading your Old Testament, if you hear reference to Judah, that's the southern kingdom. If you hear reference to Israel, or uh, sometimes they will um, uh, make reference to uh, Joseph, uh, that uh, when those references are made, they're indicating that they are part of the 10 tribes. And this northern kingdom established by Jeroboam that Jeroboam picked up real quick on the fact that um, if his people went to Jerusalem to worship, that they would eventually return 
to temple worship and that they would rebel against him and his kingship. Um, so he set up two, not one, but two golden calves. One in the southern part of the northern kingdom. So that would be just over the northern border of Judah. And then the other one in the far north at Bethel. And uh, so he was giving his people places to go to worship. And these were not instituted of God. They were instituted by Jeroboam. So um, the, the, their prophets are not saying anything of very much import. And of course, they have no connection to the temple. Neither does Amos. But Amos has heard from God, and he wants to make sure that the northern kingdom, because he has been sent to them, that he goes to the northern kingdom and delivers his prophecies. And his prophecies are, are characterized, and, and as the true prophets, that a prophecy is not so much some prediction of a future event as much as it is a declaration, thus saith the Lord, and uh, that if you happen to make that kind of a pronouncement, but you're not really sent, that that is what is the highest level of taking God's name in vain. You're claiming to be one of his prophets when you have not been sent as a prophet. Amos had been sent as a prophet. Now, we find in the verses that we read five repetitions of this phrase, yet you have not returned to me. And each one of these five pronouncements is basically something along the line of, you have seen disaster take place, and yet you have not returned to me. You have seen yourself suffer loss, and yet you have not returned to me. You have seen the weather turn bad so that the climatic conditions are such that in this agricultural community, you are unable to eke out a subsistence, and yet you have not returned to me. The gardens are falling apart. The fields are not yielding their crops, and yet you have not returned to me. Now, we have said in times past that whenever you're reading scripture and you see a particular phrase or a description of an event repeated, that that is, that's sort of like, uh, uh, and I probably shouldn't say this, but I will anyway. I'm not particularly thrilled with red, red print Bibles. Um, that put the words of Jesus in red print. Now, you don't have to go throw yours away if that's what you've got and if you like them. I'm not, it's not a, quote, serious matter, but I consider the word of God, the whole thing, to be his. And that if you want the words of Jesus, just read them. They're here. And that you don't need anybody to print a particular portion of it in red as if that means, well, I really want to pay attention to what's in red letters. But if it's in black letters, eh, it's, uh, maybe uh, it's important, maybe it's... No, it's all important. It's all important. But when you find something that is repeated in scripture 
That is the Lord's way of letting you know, hey, pay attention to this. If you're skimming, stop skimming. Because what I'm saying right here is of extreme value and importance that you will ignore this to your own hurt. So, God is saying to the Northern Kingdom, you have not returned to me. And when you see all of these things happening, when you see the wheels coming off your little red wagon, come to me. And that if you choose not to come to me, then be prepared for there to be, uh, and, and this is not co coincidence, it's not extenuating circumstances, this is God carrying out judgment against those who have chosen to ignore him. Don't ignore him. And that, that this is what I will do, Israel, he finishes up saying. In other words, prepare to meet your God. In other words, I'm on my way. And by the way, you understand, when it talks about in the Bible, when it talks about the end times, that uh, the Jews spoke in terms of two ages. There is this present age and the age to come. This present age and the age to come. And to understand the Bible properly, you need to know that linearly, if you look at this present age and the extension of that is the age to come and that these two time periods overlap. So, this present age began to dwindle and there are slight variations on this, but either with the birth of Jesus Christ in Bethlehem and some people would say, no, it was at the time of his crucifixion, at the time of his death, that that is the beginning of the end of this present age. And then the age to come begins on the day of Pentecost. And that it goes, the overlap goes, until the second coming of Christ. And then from there, things proceed into eternity. All right? So, the end times is this overlap between the present age and the age to come. And so when people say, it's the last days, yeah, and it has been. That's the reason why the Apostle Paul spoke like it was the last days, because it's the last days. And nobody knows how long this overlap is. So let's move on. First Peter Chapter 4, starting with verse 12. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. 
If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed, for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. For it is time for judgment to begin with God's household, and if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinners? So then, those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do so. What Peter is saying, he is sharing, and if you read all of, of Peter's epistle, and I guess I should say both of Peter's epistles, you pick up on the fact that he is sending a message to the church that has been dispersed. That uh, after Saul of Tarsus wreaked havoc on the early church, they were, were spread from Jerusalem. And even after Saul was converted and became Paul the Apostle, that it still didn't gather everybody back in one place, that the church was scattered. And, and Peter sends this letter to the scattered church, which is under persecution. And he writes his letter in order that they may have hope that instead of coming to the conclusion that I'm suffering, therefore it must be that I've done something wrong, he says, if you are living for Christ, don't be surprised if you suffer. Now, as you are well aware, at present time, the church does not suffer a lot of the horrors that they did in the first century. But the church is in a position where presently it is beginning to see a change in the general attitude toward the church. You probably get tired of this phrase, but when I was a kid, the church and the people in it were well thought of even among those who were not in the church. And that unless there was some, some outstanding, unusual circumstance going on in the church, that the, the pastor was likely to be regarded as one of, the, one of the people in the community that you could trust. But that has not always been the case, and it certainly isn't the case now. With the uh, rising of social media, there is a lot of language that is, is directed against the church, both clergy and laity, both those who are behind the pulpit and those who are in the pew, that there is an increasing hostility uh, that we have not seen in our lifetimes. And that Peter says that when that sort of thing happens, rejoice that you have been given the privilege of participating in the sufferings of Christ. And he is 
is not suggesting, uh, by, by the way, I, I want to just clarify this much. There have been, for years and years, um, and I saw this in my days before Jesus and have seen it subsequently, there are some people who take it upon themselves to not use any kind of reasonable approach, but to basically be obnoxious in the way that they treat people that they have identified as sinners. We're all sinners in need of a Savior. And yet, because they have experienced the regeneration of uh, that, that comes in the application of the ministry of Christ, that they somehow or another have forgotten where they came from, and now they hold themselves up uh, and, and as, as examples of the way it ought to be and tend to look down their noses at anybody who they think does not measure up. If you get persecuted for that, you bought what you paid for or you're getting what you paid for that what Peter is talking about is you are doing uh, your best to be a good citizen, a good neighbor, and a faithful follower of Jesus Christ, and yet you are picked out and selected for abuse publicly, and that as a result, you suffer. This is the sort of thing that could happen in a family where uh, once the family member declared that they had become a Christian, that they would be dismissed from the family. They would have no access to the property that they would otherwise have inherited. They would have no access to uh, their job, very likely could lose their job, they, and, and having been uh, basically thrown out of the family, that they had lost their social connections and their whatever social safety net there was in the family structure, they were out. And Peter says, even if that's what you're experiencing, that if you suffer as a Christian, in other words, for being a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. In other words, that you are suffering for the sake of Christ. Now, my, my prayer is, to the extent possible, Lord, deliver us from suffering for the name of Christ. And yet, if there's no other way for us to give faithful witness to who you are, then we submit ourselves into the hands of the Lord and ask only that he preserves us through the suffering and gives us the assurance that we have not been abandoned but that he will walk with us every step of the way. Gracious Father, enable us to receive this truth, to allow it to minister to our hearts, enable us to walk in faithfulness before you, regardless of what we face. And we unite our voices with those of the apostles, those of the first century believers who said, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen.